times our mean isn't zero, plus times our standard deviation isn't one, we have to change it using the z-score. Here, of course, our z-score is 1.58. Now, here's the important part. Everybody in here is going to be able to find a z-score. That's not a hard thing, right? Not a hard thing. You just take your value, subtract whatever I mean I give you, divide by whatever standard deviation I give you, and you get a number out of that. True? The next part that you have to do, after you find your z-score, So step number one, find z-score. Step number two, after you find that z-score, you are going to draw a picture. I don't mean like a kitty cat or a horsey, I mean like a picture of a distribution, okay? Let's say Mr. Leonard said, draw a picture of a little kitty cat. <laughs> That's my cat. I beat him up. I don't even have a cat. Actually, I do. It's a stray cat. It comes around. It's st I was stupid. I fed it once, and the thing keeps coming back. It keeps feeding me. That was my first mistake. Yeah, absolutely. Find a z-score, then draw a picture. Here's the picture I want to see for you. Now, you, you got, kind of got to know these things, but again, I'm going to kind of refresh your memory on them from time to time. X stands for what in this particular chapter? Continuous. Good. And the z-score translates a normal distribution into what? That you got to know as well. The z-score translates a normal distribution into... What's the z-score you can work with? Read through your notes if you have to. I don't care what you do. Figure that one out. Talked about it several times so far. You have an infinite number of normal distributions. You use a z-score to translate those infinite number of normal distributions into one standard, standard normal distribution. That's what a z-score does. You've got to get, get this stuff. This, this class isn't just about doing simple mathematics. That's very simple. You have to have the understanding of what's happening here. Otherwise, when you get to chapter 7 and 8, you're going to be lost. You're not going to know what to do. Right? You have to understand it in this class. That's why this class is different than like a math C. I see pretty easy. I mean, really, it's pretty easy. There's formulas, you plug numbers in, you figure it out. There's a set number of ways to do things. Statistics is different. That's why it's not a pure mathematics class. It's like sociology mixed with mathematics, mixed with uh, critical thinking. Okay, so it's those three things pretty much combined. And so when, when you're doing this, you can't just, it's not just good enough that Mr. Leonard says, do this, then do this, then do this, there's my answer. Yay! Yay, okay, that's, not, that's not good enough. Uh, you got to really understand what's going on. The x in this case is a continuous random variable. The x in the previous case was a discrete random variable. The reason why you have two different situations is because in one case you only have a set number of items. Here you have an infinite number of items. That's why we can't just find a direct probability for one value. I can't say what's the probability of finding 1.58 because there's an infinite number of possible values. The probability of finding one in that infinite number is a needle in an infinite haystack. You're never going to find it. The probability would be zero. That's a different story than last chapter. Where I said, what's the probability of finding exact, or rolling exactly five threes or pulling out exactly one heart out of a deck of cards? You could do that, right? And we'll only find a number of choices. We're in a different story here. You also need to know that we have an infinite number of possible normal distributions. For every case that you can think of, the distribution of um, age in a, in a normally distributed population, the distribution of heights or volumes of soda cans is normally distributed. Okay, there's an infinite number of those situations. We need a way to translate those things into something we can work with. You, you're not going to want to do an infinite number of problems, are you? No, you want a way to do a problem one way all the time. So you, you create something that's, that's reasonable, so you don't have to invent something new every time. The way you do that is you deal with a standard normal distribution. The way you get from a normal distribution to a standard normal distribution, I've shown this to you four, three times now, is you use a z-score. The z-score maps the mean to zero. It maps the standard one unit standard deviation away to one and two and three for those 
those uh, values that are two and three standard deviations away. So now that we talked about it, we're, we're mapping a normal distribution, any normal distribution, into a standard normal distribution. That's what the z-score does. If you haven't written that down, write that down. I mean, shoot, I'm not going to write everything on the board. We kind of need to pick that up. What is the center value for a standard normal distribution? Yeah. Good, all right. <clears throat> now here's what we do. Since the z-score maps the normal distribution to a standard normal, we just have to draw one picture of a standard normal distribution. You see, the, the cool thing about a z-score is it takes whatever value you have and it translates it into a z-score. Now in this very specific case, it's the same number because I, I chose these ones for you. I chose zero and one to make it easy. So you don't do a whole lot of math right now. But it, in this case, it, it maps a number of, of degree. This is like 1.58 degrees, right, on a thermometer. It maps that to a z-score that we can put on the standard normal distribution because that is just a listing of z-scores on the um, table and in your calculator. It's talking about z-scores there. So what we're going to do is we're going to place 1.58, the z-score that represents my value, the z-score that represents my x. So you understand that? The z-score that represents that number somewhere on this chart. Where do you think it goes? To the left of zero or right of zero? Right. Right. Sure, it's a number line, right? Z-score, no problem. About how far? One and a half. About one and a half, yeah. If, if you want to do one and two and three, about one and a half. Honestly, it doesn't really matter all that much. This doesn't have to be to scale, doesn't have to be perfect. I just need you to know basically to the left or to the right. Positives to the right, negatives to the left. So we're going to put 1.58 right here. And then what you're going to do is you're going to shade one side of this graph. And here, here's the reason why. We, we just spoke about this a second ago, but I can't ever ask you to find the probability of selecting a thermometer that has exactly a reading of 1.5 degrees. That was the needle in an infinite haystack concept. We talked about it a couple times. Also, the area under this, but you have to know this one. What's the area under this whole curve? Good. That lets you associate area with probabilities. You with me? I can explain this in a different way now. What's the area under a single line? What's the area of a line? Can you find the area? It's got a height, area is height times width, right? The height is, who cares, the width is how much? What's the width of a line, basically is what I'm asking you. The width of a line is one? Zero. This would be like a width of one, right? What I'm asking you is, what's the area of that? It doesn't have any, because a line is supposed to have no breadth, right? A line is only one dimensional, it just goes up. Doesn't, doesn't spread out, even though we draw it on paper, it has a little teeny bit of width. There's actually no area here. So if you're trying to find the area of a line, is there any area there? No. So the probability of this value, finding exactly that value, is zero. Is zero. That's two ways I've explained it now. The area concept and the, the picking out one value out of an infinite number of possible values. You just can't do it. The probability is zero. So will I ever ask you to find the exact value of a, a number like this in chapter 6 in continuous random variables. No. Discrete, yes. We just talked about discrete chapter 5. Chapter 6, no. Not so much. We can't do it. So it's always going to be this situation. What's the probability of finding a thermometer that has a reading less than something? Or greater than something? Or between two numbers? That's the only things you're going to get. You can either do less than, greater than, or between. You with me? That kind of narrows it down. It's kind of nice, actually. If there's only three situations. In this case, what am I asking you for? Am I asking you for values greater than, less than, or between? What do you think? Let's read through it. Less than. Where would less than be? To the right or to the left? To the left. Yeah, these are the readings of Z scores that have 1.58 and less. Than. Here's zero. Here's some negative Z scores. This would be greater. So what I'm asking you is, what's the probability that you're going to randomly select a thermometer and it has a reading that's over here in this region? Okay, so let me, let me kind of recap our situation. We're dealing with continuous random variables. To translate a normal distribution into a standard normal distribution, we've got to use a z-score. That's what we do. We plug in our x, which is our continuous random variable. We, we're going to be given a mean and a standard deviation for population. We use that we, to get a point, as a point value, the z-score. That z-score gets placed on our standard normal distribution. 
and now we can find the area that's associated with our picture. So important steps here. Find z-score, draw a picture. Now we're going to uh, calculate or look up the area or find the area. And by finding the area, we actually find the probability. Now, there's two ways to do it. You can use a table, or you can use your calculator. I know this is kind of down there at the bottom for some of you. I'm sorry about that. The table you're going to be using is table A2. Maybe I'll move it up here so you can see it. With a calculator, you're going to go on your calculator. I'll show you how to get there. But you're going to be using something called normal. Why normal? Hey, we're in a normal distribution. Normal CDF. Cumulative, cumulative, that's what the C means. And you're going to put in your left z-score, comma, your right z-score. I'm not supposed to write on that. Let's see if it comes off. But it's right there. So we got two options here. If you don't have a calculator, a, a graphing calculator, a statistics calculator, Use your table. It's there for you. You can use it every time. If you have a calculator, it's easier. It's, this class is way easier with one of those calculators. You just plug in the left z-score and the right z-score. We're going to talk about that in just a second. The left z-score and the right z-score. Just talk about it right now. For those of you who have a calculator, I'll show you on your calculator in just a second, but I need to explain something first. Does this ever end? Okay, so if I want a starting spot for this area, I know the ending spot, look up here at the board please if you have a calculator, the ending spot, my right z-score for this area is 1.58, do you agree? Mm -hmm. It's going to be something comma 1.58, you with me? The question is where do you start? I mean, basically this goes to negative infinity, that's where that thing goes. You can't plug in negative infinity on your calculator. So when you have a situation where you want to find an area from where it's like negative infinity to a number. You can go far enough to the left where it makes no difference really, and that number is something beyond like negative 5 or negative 6. I always plug in negative 10. Because if you go past, I mean, the, the probability of getting a value less than negative 10 standard deviations away from your mean is so small, it doesn't even make a difference anymore. It's just so close to zero, it might as well be zero. Does that make sense? So if you have a calculator where you start from the left is negative 10. Just put in negative 10. I know that's not negative infinity. This thing actually doesn't stop at negative 10, but that will give you a precise uh, approximation up to at least six or seven decimal places. You okay with that so far? So does it actually start at negative 10? No, no. But the area doesn't ever end. We're just picking some ending spot where our calculation is not going to be off tremendously. Are you with me? Are you sure? Okay, let's try this on a calculator. So what we're going to do right now we're going to look at that table, the z-score table. I'm going to show you how to do this with a table. Then right after that, I'm going to show you how to do this with a calculador. Did I say that right? Calculadora. Calculadora. 